Thank you, Raquel. Um, for the record, she did not meet me at that workshop. She inspired me at that workshop. Um, she was running an introduction to Johnny Five and NodeBots workshop in 2013 at JSConf, and I got a little RGB LED working with a node server, and so you could change the color. And um, I have wanted a light up dress or clothes since I was six. So um, yeah, I think, I think I'm, I'm getting there. Um, so anyway. A little more about me. Uh, I'm from Austin, Texas, for now. Uh, I'm a developer evangelist with Auth0. Um, I love to talk about OAuth and OpenID Connect, and, and I've read the specifications, so you don't have to. So um, feel free to you know, come talk to me about those things. Uh, my company sent me here uh, to talk about not authentication, because they're pretty awesome. Uh, I am an electrical engineering student at Arizona State University. I just started my first semester. Um, honestly, I'm just getting an electrical engineering degree so I can be more like Rockbot, but that's beside the point. Um, I am gender non-binary. Uh, they, them pronouns are preferred, though I accept all pronouns. I won't correct you or anything. And if you have any questions about what it's like to live as a genderqueer person or anything like that, feel free to ask me. Um, I, I know it can be intimidating to uh, like approach someone and say, hey, I'd like to ask you some questions. So I'm going to like open that up to y'all if y'all want to come talk to me about it. Um, I like robots, baseball, woodworking, sewing, and a bunch of other stuff. And I also have the two most adorable cats um, in the greater Austin area. Uh, the one on top is Ace, and the one on the bottom is Aria, who is totally living up to her name. Um, so my, I, I, okay, so the reason I do this, it's, it's weird. I, I've never had this problem before. All right, well, this not problem. So what's going on is I usually show this cat video because people walk into my talk like in the first few minutes of the talk, and so I play this cat video, but like I'm just gonna play it anyway. Um, so this is just after we got Arya, and that's my partner playing with her, and that's Ace looking betrayed. Okay, so that's Arya, we just gotten her. I'm playing with her, Mike's filming, and then all of a sudden he realizes in the background that Ace, our other cat, is feeling very betrayed. <laughs> Hello darkness, my old friend. <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> Um, the I want to be the baby syndrome kicked in right after that. Um, it, was, it was really funny. Um, okay, come on, mouse. There you are. All right. No, 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 no. Okay, cool. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, my dad is getting back into robotics with me. He is an electrical engineer, and um, he kind of like didn't have a hobby at all. And then I started getting into NodeBots, and then he read my book, which was like, what? And then, uh, yeah, he started doing NodeBots too, which is pretty cool. And uh, as you can tell, I have a love of JavaScript robotics. I now have over 12 pieces of clothing that run on some level of JavaScript that connect to the internet and do all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, but I have a warning. As cool as my robots are, there is more about community and people than robots in this talk. If you want to talk to me more about robots, there's this lovely event tonight called Dance.js. I will be covered in UV body paint and lights and be happy to talk to you about robots there. Um, it'll be awesome. But as important ro as robots are, community and people are more important, which sounds blasphemous, but it's true. So when I talk about community, I'm going to like, talk about what my definition of community is. And my definition of community is anyone you interact with, directly or otherwise, to use a thing is part of the community for that thing, right? And yes, this means your docs are part of your community. This means that jackass being mean on Stack Overflow is part of your community, whether you like it or not. Uh, your not so personal Twitter feed as an OSS maintainer is part of your community, whether you like it or not. Um, screen privacy all you want, but the fact is uh, the way you represent yourself in public does reflect on your project. So anyway, why do we code? Oh, uh, copious Carl Sagan quotes are about to happen. I will point out when there are Carl Sagan quotes coming. And um, yeah, and I'll, I'll cite my sources at the end as well. Uh, but why do we code? Because if you want to bake an apple pie from scratch, you must first create the universe. But, but no, really, really, why do we code? We code for work, we code to learn, and we code for fun. I'm not going to talk about coding for work because we get it. We know why we code for work. We code for work because we get paid. Yay. Coding to learn. 
a lot of coding to learn is, is not so much I'm going to set out to write this thing, it's I'm going to set out to figure out why this thing worked so I can either make it better or do a similar thing. Um, for instance, with node bots, one of the things I do is take C libraries and I say, okay, how does this work? What pins does this use? Where's the timing involved? So I can move it over to JavaScript so more people can use it. Uh, writing a hello world can be part of coding to learn and going a little deeper, building like a, a to-do list seems to be the, the canonical like, hey, I can actually make something with this. And then coding for fun. And, and this is just coding for the sake of building things, coding to push our own boundaries. Um, to answer the question, can I actually do that? Can I actually get up on a stage covered in lights and not like hurt myself? Um, uh, and we also tend to push the boundaries of the world around us. Can I walk down the street and have a six-year-old walk up to me and ask, can I do that when I grow up? And I can look at her and go, you can do this now. <laughs> I didn't have control over much as a kid. Um, I was bullied severely in high school and uh, I had a really, really, really crappy time. Um, but I had control over RPG Maker. I could go home after Java class where the boys in the class would um, tell me that I should go get them coffee and things like that. I could go home, I could open RPG Maker and I could make something. And that was a means of escapism for me. I couldn't control the world around me but I could control this thing. I could make something that was mine. I think the interrelation between coding for fun and coding for work is very intertwined. And that is that coding for work keeps us paid so that we can build our communities for fun. Isaac, Isaac kind of mentioned this in his keynote. Like he took a sabbatical and wrote NPM as a, you know, nighttime, a, a nights and weekends project. And now it's this huge thing. And I, I believe that without coding for fun, open source software as we know it wouldn't exist. Uh, because there's not a lot of real uh, business value in, in exposing all of your code, or at least there wasn't perceived to be a lot of business value in exposing all of your code to everyone ever. Now businesses are starting to realize why that's a benefit, but um, you know, before open source software kind of became a real like force, um, there wasn't much around. Uh, side projects. So these are our for fun coding projects, the ones with no real business value. Things like, oh, I don't know, package manager for Node, who needs that? There's no real business value there. It's not like they employ like 20 people now. Um, anyway, uh, but even if there's no monetary business value, there is intrinsically business value in side projects and allowing your employees to stretch their boundaries outside of their work day if they choose to. Preventing burnout is a huge thing in our industry. We have a lot of burnout for varying reasons. Um, a lot of them stem from social aspects, but there are, there's just technical burnout, you're just done. Um, bringing in new people, side projects are a great way to get people interested in code or new aspects of code or new aspects of the industry. And encouraging curiosity. Um, sure enough, if you encourage people to be curious, eventually they're gonna stumble upon something that's valuable. Uh, this is a quote from Sagan. And yet our species is young and curious and brave and shows much promise. In the last few millennia, we have made the most astonishing and unexpected discoveries about the cosmos and our place within it. Explorations that are exhilarating to consider. They remind us that humans have evolved to wonder, that understanding is a joy, and that knowledge is a prerequisite to survival. I believe our future depends on how well we know this cosmos in which we float like a mote of dust in the morning sky. Our very species, being developers, needs these side projects, be they code or otherwise, to continue to thrive. These explorations and skepticism, these, sorry, those explorations required skepticism and imagination both. Imagination will often carry us to worlds that never were, but without it, we go nowhere. Skepticism enables us to distinguish fancy from fact to test our speculations. The cosmos is rich beyond measure in elegant facts, in exquisite, in exquisite interrelationships, in the subtle machinery of awe. Now he talks about skepticism here, and I'm going to talk about skepticism as well, and a little bit, and there, there, that's why I used that quote. Um, there is some skepticism involved here with this whole like, I, I sound really positive when I'm like, side projects are great and people are great, yeah. But why code? Why has code in general become such a huge advent for side projects. You know, you don't, you don't see a lot of industries like ours branching out in an explosive manner of side projects and, and like it, encouraging them as much as code does. And I think part of that is because code 
be, allows us to begin from almost nothing. We can take a small $9 computer and build an apple pie or a raspberry Pi or an entire cosmos from scratch. <laughs> Literally scratch. Um, <laughs> yeah, some people know that language, I can tell. Um, so when we talk about science and when we talk about the thing, like the, the, the way science works, we have to build the tools before we can actually make progress. Aristophanes' only tools were sticks, eyes, feet, and brains, plus a taste for experiment. With them, he deduced the circumference of the Earth with an error of only a few percent, a remarkable achievement for 2,200 years ago. He was the first person to accurately measure the size of a planet. It was because he was able to measure the planet using sticks, his eyes, his feet, and math that he was able to advance science. Aristophanes' discovery of the measurement of the planet uh, introduced a whole new segment of math and encouraged the study of math and science in his area for about a century. Um, I know I talk a lot about side projects, and um, so I'm going to kind of back that up here with an aside on tropes. Uh, you do not have to code for fun to be a good programmer. Um, you don't. You are allowed to have other interests. And no, those don't have to include Star Wars. Uh, for instance, I like baseball and woodworking. And um, if, if, if everybody in this room could just stop going, yay, sports ball, do the thing, win the points, when I mentioned baseball, that'd be great. Because <laughs> I'm, yeah, you know, raise your hand if you like a sport, any sport. There are way more of you than you thought, aren't there? Look at that, look at that, all right? So let's all stop trying to be the cool kids and going, oh, yay, sports ball, when someone says they like sports. Because chances are, you probably like sports too. Anyway, robotics. We're moving in the same direction here as we are with code. The boards are getting cheaper. The, the barrier to entry is getting lower, not just from a, a cost perspective, but from an ease of use perspective. And there's more to gain. For instance, uh, Raquel inspired me, and I accidentally inspired this man, Donovan Buck, who's doing some really cool things with JavaScript. So this is a hexapod, and he wrote an inverse kinematic engine in JavaScript to control the joints via a leap motion controller. He's been doing NodeBots now for about two and a half years, because he came to NodeBots Day 2014, which I ran in Austin. And so yeah. That's two and a half years of work right there, um, from, from no electronics to this. So the barrier to entry via cost or experience is, is plummeting. And we're starting to be able to create really cool things uh, without a ton of um, barriers. And the NodeBots community, while we're not perfect, we're diverse, we're respectful, and we're welcoming. Um, we work very hard to keep, keep it that way. Uh, there is a code of conduct on all communications platforms for Johnny Five and for NodeBots in general. Uh, Johnny Five just in, just introduced uh, the contributors covenant to its project. So if you commit to Johnny Five, you are bound by the contributors covenant to not be a jackass and be actively kind. And um, yeah, it's 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 getting there. We're we're not perfect, but we're we're starting to. Um, become a community I'm really, really proud of in a lot of ways, not just from our actions, but from the people that represent us. Um, there, I can name more women in NodeBots than I can name women in programming that don't overlap. You know what I mean? So like I can, I, like Rockbot, Rachel White, uh, uh, Anna Gerber, uh, Emily Rose, uh, I can name them for days, but you ask me about programmers in, other, in, in Node uh, that are women that aren't NodeBots, people, and I'm like, okay, I can still name quite a few, but I'm not, it, it, the list is much more extensive for NodeBots. And NBM represents a huge step forward. They're one of the most diverse companies I've ever seen. And they are intentionally diverse. They work hard to be diverse. And that's huge in an industry full of Googles and Facebooks and places where it's just white guys everywhere, right? And to see a company like NPM not only happen to be diverse, but actively be diverse, it's huge for people like me, who are standing there thinking, oh god, I'm going to start a new job, and there's always that one person who just can't comprehend that I'm genderqueer, or has to make jokes about women, or has to make jokes about race. It's nice to see a company where 
they're actively trying to change that. But why does that matter? Why, do, why does all this matter? Why so, uh, People will roll their eyes at me from here to eternity and say, well, that's cool and all, but why does being, people being nice even matter? Because people are more important than code. People are more important than robots, because without people, we don't have code and robots, at least for now. <laughs> and unfortunately, that fact has me the most optimistic and yet the most cynical about Node as a community uh, in general. So I use the analogy of the Library of Alexandria, which I think should be taught in a lot more history classes than it currently is. This is a quote. For centuries, they supported research and maintained in the library a working environment for the best minds of the age. It contained 10 large research halls, each devoted to a separate subject, fountains and colonnades, botanical gardens, a zoo, dissecting rooms, an observatory, and a great dining hall where, at leisure, was conducted the critical discussion of ideas. The heart of the library was its collection of books. The organizers combed the cultures and languages of the world. They sent agents abroad to buy up libraries. Commercial ships docking in Alexandria were searched by the police, not for contraband, but for books. The scrolls were borrowed, copied, and then returned to their owners. Accurate numbers are difficult to estimate, but it seems probable that the library contained half a million volumes, each a handwritten papyrus scroll. This was in the BCE. This was thousands of years ago that we had this. We have that library in the internet. Like, that's been established. The analogy is clear there. We have hundreds of thousands of resources available to us fairly freely through the internet. But I find we are lacking in our passion to fill the library with interested minds willing to engage in critical discussion. Node is still very polymonochromatic. And what I mean by that, it is monochromatic in several ways. Node is very white. Node is very male, cis, hetero. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not cool with that. We need, to, we need to de poly the monochromatic and then we need to get rid of the monochromatic. Let's make it a rainbow. I'm kind of a fan of rainbows. Go check out the inclusivity working group's GitHub issues, or better yet, don't because they're an absolute garbage fire. And if you didn't know any inclusivity working group existed for Node, now you do, and you should thank them and give them a high five. Um, AG Dubs is one of the members because, yeah, she's awesome. You should give her a high five. And the well actuallys are abound. Every time you stack overflow a node question, um, you'll find several snarky people telling you either not to use node, uh, that it's NPM's fault, or that you're obviously using the wrong library. For instance, I asked a Restify question and was told, well, you should use Express. That's why. Thanks. We are, in fact, disturbingly close to the fate of the library at Alexandria. This is a quote about what happened. What happened to all those books? The classical civilization that created them disintegrated and the library itself was deliberately destroyed. Only a small fraction of its work survived along with a few pathetic scattered fragments. And how tantalizing those bits and pieces are. We know for example that there was on the library shelves a book by the astronomer Aristarchus of Samos who agreed that the earth is one of the planets which like them orbits the sun and that the stars are enormously far away. Each of these conclusions is entirely correct, but we had to wait nearly 2,000 years for that rediscovery. If we multiply by 100,000 our sense of loss for this work of Aristarchus, we begin to appreciate the grandeur of the achievement of classical civilization and the tragedy of its destruction. We are not actively destroying work here, but what we are doing is actively chasing people away from the community and actively convincing people not to join in the first place. And that itself is an act of destruction because we are destroying potential. But every person that is disinterested in Node because of a, a jackass Stack Overflow comment or a joke made about women at a conference or hearing the horror stories of being a non-male in tech, we are destroying the potential of an author in the library, of another face to discuss critical ideas with of the next person to come up with a great idea that will transform the way we think about Node. There's even infighting in Node bots. Um, there's been some serious issues between Johnny Five and other platforms, um, including some personal comments against other products. I'm a fan of everything. I have at least one of just about every microcontroller, and I try to use everything. 
but there's a lot of infighting between the groups. And um, whose product is best is not a fight I want to participate in. I don't even think it should be happening. As you may have noticed, trashing NPM has become popular in some circles because this is totally high school and we totally need something to trash. We can't just, you know, be positive about everything. <laughs> Aubergines. I'm just going to leave that one there and everyone who laughs knows what I'm talking about. A few notes on privilege um, because this is the point where people go, well, you're, you're, you know, you're going to talk about privilege and you're going to talk about community and so you're just... You're just gonna, you know, talk about how I'm bad and I'm horrible, and uh, but I have, you know, I worked hard to get here, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. I am not taking that away from you. Privilege is a spectrum, not a binary. Just because you're a cis white male doesn't mean you didn't work hard. In fact, there are a lot of different ways that cis white males can actually have a lack of privilege. For instance, coming from a, a rough socioeconomic background, if you grew up poor that is a part of the spectrum that you lack. You lack that spectrum of privilege. It doesn't add to, or it doesn't take away from the fact that you are still privileged by being a white male, but it does add to your background. It is complex. Privilege is very complex. Uh, for instance, I'm genderqueer, but I am perceived by other people as a cis woman. This comes with benefits and this comes with downsides. Because I am not perceived as a trans woman, I do not have to put up with any of the crap that trans women have to put up with. And I'm really lucky to not have to do that because it's horrible. But at the same time, I'm being denied my own identity when people assume that I am a cis woman. You are allowed to be upset over how you are treated even if someone else has it worse. I'm gonna run a little over, just a heads up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you are allowed to be upset over how you are treated, even if someone else has it worse. In fact, you should be angry for them and with them. I am not trans, but I am extremely angry over how trans people are treated in this country. Bathroom bills make me want to throw things, and I live in a state that actively says we are putting up bathroom bills so men don't enter the women's restrooms. Trans women are women. Anyway. And I'm allowed to be angry about that even though I'm not a trans woman. You're allowed to be angry at the treatment of women if you're not a woman. And it, you, as a victim, do not have to remain silent. However, if you choose to, that is also fine. I meet a lot of people who feel guilty about being silent. There are plenty of good reasons to remain silent in the age that we live in. But if you don't want to be silent, if you want, reach out. You're not alone. I'm a victim of sexual harassment in the, the tech industry. I'm a victim of lots of misogyny in the tech industry. I'm a victim of a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of microaggressions in the tech industry. If you're a victim and you need someone to talk to, um, of course, on the case of pure anonymity, if you wish, we're out here. Come talk to us. Codes of conduct in the library. We create rules in our community to allow people in, not keep people out. We all make mistakes. Codes of conduct are not about exile and shame, but about education and reform. <laughs> we only remove unrepentant and repeated infringers of codes of conduct. If you make a joke and you didn't realize it was racist and we call you on it and you say, oh my God, I am so sorry, I am never making that joke again, we're not going to kick you out of the conference. We're not going to kick you out of the community. However, if you continue to make that joke after being warned several times that it is a racist joke, yes, eventually something bad will happen. We need these rules because we do not all act like adults all the time. There is a lot of alcohol at tech events, for instance, and while many of us do partake, some don't. And the ones that don't, I, I temporarily didn't. And no, we definitely don't act like adults when we're on alcohol. <laughs> and even when we do act like adults, we slip up. We are a product of our upbringing. And the past epochs have horrible instances of misogyny and racism that have been ingrained in our upbringings since birth. We will make mistakes. But we have to try to be better. We are not an angry mob. We are simply asking for a framework to ensure equal respect and treatment of all. The resistance to codes of conduct is uh, pretty cut cookie cutter. Like I haven't seen most of these, or uh, arguments outside most of these. 
If we lived in a perfect world, we wouldn't need them. Well, we also wouldn't need laws against murder and theft, but we do because they happen and we need a code of conduct because bad things happen, mistakes happen. We need to have a framework for how to deal with them. I find the most resistance from codes of conduct come from the very people that don't need its protection. Um, I have started asking people when they tell me they're not a fan of codes of conduct, have you ever been assaulted at a conference? No. Have you ever been, have you ever had your, uh, the authenticity of your work or the authenticity of your skill questioned at a conference? No. Have you ever been called out by your race? No. Gee, I wonder why you're against codes of conduct. Uh, I was told recently by someone very prominent in the community, you should judge code or hardware, not people. First of all, I'm not judging. The intent is not to pass judgment on those to infringe, but to ensure that all attendees of an event or participants of a community are treated with dignity, fairness, and respect. This is not about targeting the people who mess up. This is about protecting everyone else and everyone, really, even the ones who do mess up, because we all mess up and we want to protect everybody. You can't just exile people you don't like. I hear this one a lot. Codes of conduct are about education, not exile, and inclusion, not exile. No one is perfect, including and especially myself, and this is recognized. If you read codes of conduct, they're not, we're gonna kick you out if you make a bad joke. They're, if you experience harassment, please contact one of these people and it will be mediated in a manner that, will, that we will try to benefit everybody. It's not, this is what will happen to you if you mess up. It's, if you are the victim of a problem, please talk to us and we will figure it out. You don't win allies by shouting and being angry. Yeah, well, sitting by and doing nothing didn't do me. Jack did it. <laughs> Without confronting prejudice, it will continue unabated and perhaps even get worse. Here's a quote. Prejudice literally means prejudgment, the rejection of a contention out of hand before examining the evidence. Prejudice is the result of powerful emotions, not of sound reasoning. The allegory between ancient science and today's communities. The problem then was that the rules of society prevented the study and spread of ideas. As we know, the Dark Ages was caused by the fact that the, the churches of the time shut down all scientific inquiry that might disturb uh, religious doctrine. And so scientific efforts were quelched. Uh, scientists like Galileo were jailed and threatened with death for trying to explore the universe using science. Today, the lack of rule systems allows the oppression created by the former system to prevent the study and spread of ideas. So we have kind of an inverse problem here. Instead of rules preventing the study and spread of ideas, we have the internet, where there are very few rules that prevent you from studying and spreading ideas. However, the lack of a rule system about how we act towards each other creates an, a system of oppression that was created by the former system that put people in power to prevent the study and spread of ideas, implicitly rather than explicitly. But not everything's so bad. Um, I do have some optimism. The allegory here is Ionia. It's a small group of islands, um, and this was about around the time of Alexandria, um, a, a little bit after. So basically, Ionia was founded in the middle of the lifespan of Alexandria, and it lasted until shortly after the, the downfall of Alexandria. With many different islands, there was a variety of political systems. No single concentration of power could enforce social and intellectual conformity in all the islands. Free inquiry became possible. The promotion of superstition was not considered a political necessity unlike today. Unlike many other cultures, the Ionians were at the crossroads of civilizations, not at one of the centers. The Phoenician al alphabet was first adapted to Greek usage and widespread literacy became possible. Writing was no longer a monopoly of the priests and the scribes. The thoughts of many were available for consideration and debate. It was in the Eastern Mediterranean that African, Asian, and European civilizations, including the great cultures of Egypt and Mesopotamia, met and cross-fertilized in a vigorous and heady confrontation of prejudices, languages, ideas, and gods. We live in Ionia, in the internet. There is no one central authority uh, that tells us what node framework we have to use, or whether to use lodash or underscore, or whether to use semicolons or not. Um, there's one person who thinks he is, but he can go shove. Um, I seriously happy cry at what goes on at NPM all the time. Um, when I heard CJ was being made CTO, I actually did cry because 
for the first time in my life, I saw a role model in a position that made me feel like I can get somewhere. Because a lot of the times it feels like I'm banging my head against a brick wall. A lot of the times when I build these robots and I go to conferences and people ask me, who built that for you? And it chips away at me little by little by little. Who built that for you? Oh, oh, I was uh, doing a battery diagnostic test uh, a couple of days ago and walking through the park with my partner who is male. And he was carrying one of my glow sticks that you'll see tonight and I was wearing everything else. And uh, three people separately walked up to him and said, how'd you make this? And he pointed at me and said, well, she made it. One guy said, aha, very funny, but seriously, how'd you make it? Yeah, that's great. So seeing NPM makes me happy cry because there is, some, there is a company doing some good in the world and good, do, trying to create those role models and remind people like me that there's a reason to stick around and keep making robots and to keep trying and to keep standing up and telling people, hey, I made those. Those are mine. I made them. A note on destroying your idols. Now, I talk about role models, and I talk about idols. Role models are people you aspire to be despite their faults. Idols are people you worship despite their faults. So you don't acknowledge their faults, you only acknowledge the good side of them. We don't need idols in Node. We don't. Um, everybody should be suspect to scrutiny. Everyone's actions and behavior should be a reflection upon themselves, no matter how damn good their code is, no matter how damn many times their module has been downloaded, and no matter how many times they've given a talk. I don't care. Their personal behavior is suspect to criticism, just like everybody else. We let way too many people get away with bad behavior because they wrote a library or give sound technical advice. We need to start objectively viewing the behavior of a person along with their technical output. Quote about Ionia. What do you do when you are faced with several different gods each claiming the same territory? The Babylonian Marduk and the Greek Zeus was each considered master of the sky and king of the gods. You might decide that Marduk and Zeus were really the same. You might also decide that since they had quite different attributes, that one of them was merely invented by the priests. But if one, why not both? And so it was that the great idea arose. The realization that there may be a way to know the world without the god hypothesis that there might be principles, forces, laws of nature through which the world could be understood without attributing the fall of every sparrow to the direct intervention of Zeus. Thinking about that, I think we have way too many Zeuses in Node. We are also at our best a global version of Ionia. Information is freely available and besides the pessimism of how we treat each other, we are getting code and robotics into the hands of more people than ever. But we must work much harder to prevent destruction, like we currently work to spread information. Okay, here's the list of excuses I hear, because I hear a lot of them every week or so. But I haven't seen this happen, so it must be okay. In many such cases, we are not unbiased observers. We have an emotional stake in the outcome, perhaps merely because the borderline belief system, if true, makes the world a more interesting place but perhaps there is something there that strikes much more deeply into the human psyche. We want our community to be great. We want our community to be the best, but that doesn't mean we can bulldoze over our problems and pretend they don't exist. Just because you've never experienced harassment, don't get me wrong, I'm super glad that you've never experienced harassment. It sucks and I'm really happy for you. Like, and I'm not being sarcastic or anything. That's great if you've never experienced harassment, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. But, but this person or company or whoever who messed up does so many good things. That's good. And it's good that they do good things. That doesn't mean we shouldn't call out the bad. Sagan talks a lot about pseudoscience and debunking pseudoscience. And at one point, he talks about prophetic dreams. And he had what he felt was a prophetic dream of a family member dying. He woke up, called the family member, and it turned out they were still alive. His prophetic dream was not prophetic. After my experience, I did not write a letter relating a compelling predictive dream that was not born out of reality. That is not a memorable letter. When it comes to things like this, the hits are recorded, the misses are not. Um, I'm gonna scream this at the top of my lungs until it's not true anymore. Everything is not great, Meristoc meritocracy is still a myth, and telling yourself anything different is not only not helping, it's detrimental to the community. Because by telling yourself that meritocracy is how things work is actively engaging in the exclusion of others. Yeah, 
speed it up. I'm almost done. Um, my ultimatum here is we do not need horrible people that happen to write good code in our communities. If we support everyone and become Ionia presiding over Alexandria, the good code will follow. The more people we have coding, the more people we have in Node, the better our code will get. And the best way to do that is by preventing exclusion. And the best way to do that is by removing unrepentant and repeated harassers, oppressors, and abusers. The spark of hope here is uh, Johannes Kepler. Created the laws of planetary motion and began to discover the fundamental underpinnings of gravity in a time where you were jailed for thinking that the sun was not the center, or the sun was the center of the solar system, or the universe even. Science is based on experiment, on a willingness to challenge old dogma, on an openness to see the universe as it really is. Accordingly, science sometimes requires courage, at least the very least the courage to question the conventional wisdom. You too can be a Kepler. How? Call out the crap that you see. I don't know how many times I'm gonna have to say that and I sound angry and that's because I am, because I do this every time I talk about how we need to call out the crap that happens around us and people go, oh yeah, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll get right on that. No, no you don't. don't. Don't lie to yourself, don't lie to me. Call out the crap. Yes, it matters. It can be private and simple. If someone makes a racist joke, you can pull them aside and say, hey, that was racist, I wouldn't make that joke again. Maybe think about what you're saying. It's simple, it's private, it's fine. Yes, it matters, and yes, it feels like screaming into the void. Every day feels like screaming into the void for some of us. But you have, we have to do it. We as a community have to do this, every single one of us. Now what to do if you're called on your crap, because you will be. Listen, learn, and remember, it's criticism of your actions, not your character. A lot of people get defensive because when they're called out on their crap, they say, but I'm a good person. We're not saying you're not. We're saying you messed up. Please reconsider your actions. How else can I, as a privileged person, help? I don't, I, I don't know why I said it with that inflection, but whatever. <laughs> One of the most radical things you can do is actually believe women when they talk about their experiences. I say that except extended to everyone from any marginalized group, especially if someone is confiding in you to something that just happened to them and there is a reason for this. Scientific studies show that there is a stage shortly after an eyewitness event in which we verbalize what we think we have seen and we take the feedback from that verbalization and we lock it into our memories forever. We are very vulnerable at that stage and any prevailing beliefs can unconsciously influence our eyewitness account. So if someone comes up to you as a friend and confides that they have been harassed and you tell them it's no big deal, you have just made it not a big deal. You have just reinforced the status quo and you have just completely undone their experience for them in a lot of cases. This is scientifically proven and it is one of the worst things you could possibly do. Instead, if you don't know what to do, point to an organizer, do something. Just don't tell them it wasn't a big deal. Do not tell them it wasn't a big deal. Even if you really don't think it wasn't a big deal, don't tell them that, that's not your call. Point to an organizer, tell them to report it, because like Ashley said, they'd rather hear about it and have it turn out to be not much than not hear about it and it's actually a big deal. Also, please stop asking or saying the following, is it really that bad, yes. Is, I've never seen anything like that, good for you. But text one of the better industries right. <laughs> So anyways, I play a lot of video games, and uh, this is one of my last thoughts. I wanna go from this, this is Team Fortress 2, and as you'll notice, every single character is a white guy. That sucks. This is Overwatch. Overwatch is awesome. You know why? Because there are women, there are different cultures, there are different body types, there are different representations of sexuality. Uh, we need a transgender character in Overwatch, but other than that, we have a huge, like, look at that. Um, English, there, there's the UK, there's Germany, there's uh, India, there's uh, China, and May has a very nice body type that is not typical of females in video games, and she's so adorable. Anyway, uh, no, because that's three pages long, but if you want to read that final thought, let me know. Citations and recommended reading. Um, uh, you've got most of my quotes here from Broca's Brain in Reflections on the Romance of Science and the Varieties of Scientific Experience, both by Carl Sagan. If you're going to take a picture, now would be the time because I'm going to leave this slide up for about 15 seconds. Uh, these books are amazing and they change the way I think about science and culture. And I'll give you all about five more seconds because I'm way over time. All right. 
Um, as Carl Sagan is indicating to you, you are awesome for listening to me. Uh, my Twitter handle, GitHub handle, everything handle is NodeBotanist. Uh, the lower uh, email address is my uh, work address, but you can also email, email me at the at NodeBotanist, like dot ST, um, that, that domain works. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.